Welcome to Home Teams. It's a delight to be with every one of you on this glorious Tuesday night, right after the celebration of Easter Sunday, the day we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There will be all church prayer this Friday. We're back to our all night prayer in two hour segments, starting at eight and ending at eight, eight to 10, 10 to 12, 12 to two, two to four, four to six, six to eight. Find a two hour segment and come and get close to the Lord. Nothing ever can replace our prayers. Also, men's conference is going on this Friday and Saturday. For those men who are able to go, please go and enjoy yourselves and get plugged in for the challenges that we have in front of us. Our text this week is found in the book of Galatians, chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. Why don't you follow along with me as we learn something very important tonight? Now I say that the heir, that's referring to one that was to receive an inheritance or a great amount of things bequeathed to him by one who was very wealthy, an heir. The heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. Paul is writing to the church at Galatia and is trying to make clear what the responsibilities of one who has a great inheritance coming to him was. But then he brings it to us who have been brought into this amazing kingdom of an inheritance and says, even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of The time was come. God sent forth his son. And this part I want you to pay close attention to. This is a description of Jesus. God sent forth his son, made of woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive adoption of sons. I feel impressed for the next season, maybe throughout the summer, to just accentuate our understanding of who Jesus is. We, more than ever, need to have a revelation of why we preach Jesus, why we sing Jesus, why we believe in Jesus, why we practice the teachings of Jesus. Atheism is stronger than it has ever been in probably the history of the world because it is a pretty new doctrine in that the majority of history records that governments, nations, people groups all practiced a pursuit of God. They all had faith and this modern day era sent send out the idea that it was out of ignorance that they followed God. But the question that I have is who is the one pursuing ignorance. The scripture tells us the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. But it's the brazenness of atheism that is marching down our uh, centers of learning in our schools, our colleges. Even some churches are now pursuing this idea of church without God. Church has become a community center. So I want us to get a grip on who Jesus is. Atheism has stickers out now that many people put on their cars. One, it says born again humanists. Another one says God, less is more. Uh, I believe in life before death is another atheistic type of sticker. Stay away from church. One says it is all fake news. And so here, the brazenness of atheism feels bold in this modern era to propose that their way is the right way. In fact, one of their popular claims is that Christianity is responsible for most of the wars. When Axelrod, in his book, The Encyclopedia of Wars, studied this, he came forward with the understanding that the wars of the earth that has been recorded since 8,000 BC is what he proposes. Since 8,000 BC, uh, that the wars have been primarily over economic status, territorial battles, civic unrest, 
or uh, revolutionary conflicts. Four things he ascribes wars to fall to. In fact, he attests that after his study was complete, that 6.98% of all wars in that period can be ascribed to religious purposes. He went so far as to say, if you remove the Muslim conflicts uh, from that war, the Islamic battles, that the Christian causes that can be mapped out as wars that have been recorded fall to the number of 3.2%. In other words, over 96% of all wars cannot be traced to religious causes of Jesus Christ or Christianity. But Of course, that's not what you hear, the narrative of many people in this world. And yet I would contend that abortions, foundation, suicides, homicides, state-sponsored euthanasia, infanticide, all stand on a foundation of a absent of God or absent of the afterlife or absent of life after death kind and construct of ways of thinking. What I want to propose is that the gospel of Jesus Christ for this hour. We know it's what matters to us. Romans 1 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. Here's what we are. We are very much people who have Jewish folks as our heroes. Jesus was a Jew. The first apostles, the first church was a Jewish church. It was many years before the church even, or a great season, I should say, before the church got into the Gentile era, which was known then as the Grecians. Uh, The Bible tells us that the gospel would come first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. And so this is why, even though Christendom have had records in history of having a subtle anti-Semitism in it, that will never be acceptable in the apostolic church because the gospel of salvation came primarily and first from the Jew. And this is why even this day we celebrate our Jewish friends. After the pandemic, Harvard professor Steven Pinker came out against the reopening of society. Now listen to his reasoning. In May 21st, 2020, he said, the push for reopening society from the lockdowns comes from Christianity's malignant delusion of life after death. And so this is what secularists and uh, atheists and humanists would like to propose that anyone who has a life after death scenario in their heart, their soul, their spirit, they're following a malignant delusion. Ladies and gentlemen of the cathedral, everyone in home teams tonight, you have got to get a grip deep in your soul on the things that we believe because there is a press from forces demonic that are coming to try to separate us from the love of Christ Oh, yes, the love of Jesus Christ. In one of the largest studies of its kind, the massive Social Capital Community Benchmark Survey, which happened in the year 2000, 24 years ago. That's pre-social media. But here's what the study was conducted at the John F. Kennedy Business School at Harvard University. It was the largest of its kind to try to find out who and what people groups get involved in the the development and blessedness of helping one another in community. It was not a religious survey. It was just trying to see where we get our our or go from, if I could say it like that, to help one another and to stand by one another and even to donate to great causes. The, it collected data on civic participation, trust, and the strength of civic social networks in America. It found that religious people, people of faith, uh, are 25 percentage points more likely than secularists to donate money and 23 more points likely to volunteer of their time to help the civic structures and community. What is this all about? Well, we are living in an hour that there is an assault on people who follow Jesus. 
They're not so much against faith and spiritualism, but they are anti-Jesus people. The Unitarian Universalists Association is a, what they say a oneness association. They don't buy into the idea that there are three gods or even a division of the Godhead, but that there is just one. He's much put in the same category as the Muslims are. They believe in one God as the Jewish Judaizers or Jewish people believe there is one God. And we as apostolics say that there's one God manifest in three different manifestations. But Jesus is a critical component to our understanding of God because the Father, according to the New Testament, is a God that men have never seen at any time. He is both omnipresent, which means he's everywhere all at once, means he's omnipotent, which means he's all-powerful and omniscient. He's all-knowing. Jesus wasn't any of those things. But Jesus was God manifest in the flesh. That's why the understanding of our text is so very, very important in our study of the oneness of God and who Jesus is. The Bible says in our text, God sent forth his son, and here's the critical distinctions of Jesus Christ, made of a woman, made under the law to redeem them that are under the law. So God decided that the way to bring redemption to fallen man was that he would come, robe himself in flesh, put on the limitations of flesh. In other words, he would be made of a woman. Now, everyone under the sound of my voice is made of a woman, (laughs) but God was not made of woman. God is. God is the I am. But for us to get to the all-powerful, omnipotent, all-knowing God, he decided to use this becoming a man, made of woman, made under the law, a man that would need to sleep, need to eat, was thirsty, was hungry, a man that we could relate to, yet without sin, being tempted in every point like as we, and yet without sin. Ah, that's the reason Colossians 3, 17 says, whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of Jesus. Now, that doesn't mean going around saying, uh, in Jesus' name this and in Jesus' name that. No, we have interpreted it sometimes in that manner, and there's nothing wrong with saying I do it in Jesus' name. But there's never a prayer recorded like that in the New Testament. What was the Lord meaning if it was modeled that we pray in Jesus' name. What was it meaning? It wasn't meaning that you're absent his words in your mouth, but the disciples were persecuted because they preached Jesus. They carried themselves in a manner that was like Jesus. They were his representatives. In fact, Jesus said there will be some that came and say, we did many wonderful works in your name. The truth was they misunderstood that saying his name didn't necessarily mean they were operating in his name because Jesus said, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. Oh, Lord, I do not want to confuse saying I pray in Jesus' name, I preach in Jesus' name with the same thing as being an ambassador of Jesus Christ. You know what that means? It means we eat different than the world. Yeah, It affects how we eat. It affects what we drink. It affects how we party. It affects how we relax. It affects how we vacation. It affects the philosophies that we buy into in this world. We even fight differently because we're followers of Jesus Christ. And so this is why We are weary, so was Jesus. Sometimes we get worn down, so was Jesus. Sometimes we're thirsty, so was Jesus. Many times we're needy, so was Jesus. But that's why we're followers of Jesus Christ. Jesus, God in the flesh. Jesus said, when you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Why? Because he was the express image of the invisible God. Mm the express image of the invisible God. When we get to heaven, we will see Jesus. 
We will not see a silver-headed man over here on one side and Jesus at his right side and then a dove fluttering over his shoulder. No. These are all representations and metaphors and pictures of the spirit of the living God who chose to manifest himself as a man, the man Christ Jesus. Do you know who Jesus is? This is why we will baptize in the name of of Jesus Christ. For Acts 4.24, there is not salvation in any other name, for there is no other name under heaven given among men, that's us humanity, whereby we must be saved. I love you, and I'm thankful to be baptized in the only manner modeled in the scripture. That's who we are. We are not Jesus only. We are Jesus, the door, the water, the bread, people who have access to God, the all-powerful, God, the omniscient, God, the all-knowing through the door, Jesus Christ. Let's get to know him.